As women, we are often overwhelmed by life, and the result is stress, fatigue, worry, and depression. In fact, according to the National Institute of Mental Health and the American Psychological Association, women are more likely than men to suffer from depression and poor health. But it doesn't have to be that way. The truth is, we were made to be overwhelmed. You were made to be overwhelmed, not by this world, but by the creator of this world. There is freedom in learning to be more overwhelmed with God, with his goodness, love, and mercy, and less overwhelmed with life. And that's what this study is all about. You'll learn how to let go of control, fear, and doubt, and grab onto more faith, confidence, and trust in God as we walk together through the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. From the news that she would give birth to God's son, to the day that she witnessed his tragic death on the cross, we'll go from overwhelming joy to overwhelming sorrow and back again. In the end, you'll have a deeper experience of the overwhelming grace and love of God. My prayer is that after this study, you'll be able to hold on to that faith even when it seems that all is lost. So let's dive in. Hi, I'm Haley DeMarco, and I am excited to begin this journey with you and walk hand in hand through a woman overwhelmed. You are not alone, okay? I want you to know that. We all feel the sensation from time to time of like drowning, if not, if not constantly. But I just hope that coming together to study God's word on the subject will give us all a bit of relief and hope. Like I, I know it has for me. Uh, you know, I go figure that the day that I have to come and speak to you all, actually the day before, I throw my back out. Uh, I lose my voice, and then I got contacts that I ordered that came in that were totally wrong. I couldn't see anything. So I thought, I can't see you, I can't stand, and I can't talk. What a, great, <laughs> what a great time for me to come and speak to you all. But I think that God just lets that happen. So, you know, you have to speak on a woman overwhelmed. You better know right now what it's like to be overwhelmed. And so I completely understand that. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, stories that I'm going to share with you about my own overwhelmed life. Uh, there's a lot of Times when I have to just laugh at myself. Of course, it's easier to laugh when it's like in the rearview mirror than when I'm in the middle of it. So I'll tell you a lot of my rearview mirror stuff. Oh, what the heck. I'll tell you some of my current mess too. But um, I hope that you all have a lot of fun and that you are able to laugh at me and at yourself. There was a time when I went to speak to a, a group that didn't know me. And I know some of you know me here pretty well. So, but I've spoken once to a group where like, I don't think any woman knew me that was sitting in the audience. And I started to speak and I started to tell my story, which I think is rather funny. And they all just stared at me like, what is this? What is she saying? Because the words I said and the ways I described myself, I guess were shocking, I guess, for someone that came to a church to speak. I don't know, I just, thought, I just wanted them to laugh at me. So you have permission to laugh when you're sitting with your friends and you have permission to laugh right here in the audience, all right. My husband, Michael, is the youngest of six kids and they were all born three years apart. And so I did the math on that and I figured out that his mother had a baby in diapers for 20 years. No, that just sounds, that's completely overwhelming to me. I remember when we brought our daughter home and I was completely overwhelmed with the idea of what, what do you do with this thing? And they told me, nurse her. So I'm like, okay, what's that mean? <laughs> and I sat down and I literally couldn't figure out how to make it work. <laughs> and so my husband was sitting there trying to cheer me on. It's the middle of the night and I, I was done. I was just done. She wouldn't drink. She wouldn't do anything. And so I said, you do you think that they would, they would take her back over at the hospital? you think they'd take her back? <laughs> I was completely honest. I, I couldn't do it any longer. It was day two. I couldn't do it any longer. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, no, honey, they can't take her back. She's actually ours. And I was like, stupidest idea we've ever had. It is crazy. But then I started thinking about the, the first woman overwhelmed, Eve. And I was thinking how overwhelming that would be for her. Oh, Eve, uh, here, this is your husband. He's going to be naming all the animals. And you, you're going to be making all the people. <laughs> but you have like 800 years to do it. So, you know, don't worry. Pregnant for centuries. <laughs> How could that be overwhelming? <laughs> I remember when I thought 37 was 800 years because <laughs> that's what it felt like. I had been single for 37 years and I was like, I was tired of it. I couldn't believe this was happening to me. I mean, I was tired of 
sitting around the house eating a quart of ice cream by myself. I wanted someone to watch me. <laughs> and I was tired of going shopping by myself because I really, I'm a firm believer that it is not shopping therapy unless there's someone there to tell you how cute you look when you try it on. So I was just, I, I didn't want to live like this anymore. So I decided that I would dive into that smorgasbord of single hot men that is christianmingle.com. And I got my scoop and spoon ready. I'm dishing up. I'm dishing up all these profiles. I'm looking at all these men. I'm thinking, these are great, kind of. And then I saw the one. And it was this, it was this picture of a guy, and he's, <laughs> he's making a monkey face while he's posing next to Rafiki from The Lion King. Ah, I was like, oh, that's him. <laughs> Most people are looking for the hot guy with his jet plane, I don't know, his, his uh, sports car. And me, I'm just like, no, he, can, he doesn't take himself too seriously. So I was, very, I was very excited about that. And then I started reading his profile. And I saw he was the youngest of six kids, and I thought, this is great. I'm an only child, instant family. Don't have to do the work, you know, there they are. And so then I, I see he's a writer and he's a speaker. That's what I am, I think that's really cool. In fact, I figured that I can, if I work it just right, he can become my manager. And then I've made, I've made it like the two for the price of one. I got a husband and a manager, bang, which is what I actually did. I was very, <laughs> I was very uh, overwhelmed with life. And then I met Michael and I became overwhelmed with just infatuation. I can remember <laughs> we'd drive down the road and I would just have my hand, my chin on my hand, and I'd just stare at him. And I don't, I don't know how he could stand it because I was literally just constantly, my eyes were on him. And when we'd go out to eat, we'd sit down, I'd jump in the booth next to him so I could be touching him, smelling him, and looking at him all at once. I was the stalker girlfriend, I'm sure he wished he never had. But I was overwhelmed with just the excitement. 37 years, finally, I'd, I'd, found, I'd found a man. Maybe you can tell that when I, when I do something, whether it's something terrible or something great, I give it 110%. <laughs> I think that's the definition of being overwhelmed. You give it more than what you have. And so you find yourself with not enough to cover everything that has to be done, whether it's great joy or where it, whether it's a lot of work. You find yourself completely unable to handle it all. So this week we looked at the life of, of our girl from Nazareth, Mary, and her encounter with Gabriel when he, gave her, when he gave her the news that she was going from carpenter bride to carpenter mama in the next, I don't know, split second. And I can't imagine how overwhelming that, just that information would be. I don't know about you, but I like to have everything planned out. I like to know where I'm going to be tomorrow and the next day. And that would have just changed everyone's plans in a heartbeat. Not to mention the fact that in, in her day and age, when, when a woman became pregnant out of wedlock, of course, she wasn't given her own reality TV show. <laughs> she was actually faced with a potential death, uh, stoning death that, that could have happened for, for women who committed that kind of sin. And when Michael and I were we're dating. He was on the West Coast, about 2,000 miles left of me. And I can remember that our favorite inventor at the time was Alexander Graham Bell. We were constantly, and I constantly, well, not both hands. <laughs> that would be if like I had two guys, which I kind of did. <laughs> I, I, no, I didn't really have two guys. Okay, everybody don't freak out. What I, what I actually had was I was dating Michael, and we were moving along really great. Everything was wonderful. And then one day, my ex-boyfriend was at the house collecting a couch that I, I had kept for him forever. And um, he's there, and my phone rings. And the ex decides to answer the phone, which I know is Michael, because he's supposed to call. And I'm like running, try to get to the phone without making a sound, because I don't want Michael to hear me going, no! So I'm like, no, 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 no. And he, of course, I picks it up, and hey, how are you doing? And I thought of all the things that went through my head that Michael could be thinking because this guy has a particular accent, he would have been like, what's he doing there? Oh my goodness, is she cheating on me? The things that would have hurt his feelings would have caused him to leave. Just not, not okay, not similar to Mary at all, but, but my ability in, in my own life to say, gosh, I, I know kind of how that would feel to have to tell someone something that m they might get the wrong impression on. And that's exactly what happens, I'm sure, to a lot of us. But in, in Mary's instance, she had a lot that she had to share with Joseph. So just imagine the things that would have been going through Mary's head at the time. Now, I, don't, I don't like to put words into biblical people's mouths, but I think that this whole situation would have had her overwhelming meter, you know, <laughs> blowing. It would, have been, it would have been a difficult situation. But amazingly, Mary doesn't react the way that I think I would, and maybe a lot of you. We see that in, 
in Luke 1, 38. Listen to what she says when Gabriel tells her this news that would change her plans, that would change her life, that would potentially lead her to death. This is what Mary says. I am the Lord's servant. Let everything you have said happen to me. Okay, think about that, that for a minute. That, that's, like, that's like me saying uh, to someone who's telling me what to do, sure, whatever you want, honey. That's not my first response, just so you know. <laughs> my first response is usually more like, are you sure? Because I was thinking, and I, I have, what I'm thinking has to come out. And I have to communicate that with whoever's trying to tell me I'm going to do something different. But yet, that's not what Mary did. She said that his plans are now her plans. That's how I want to live my life. Your plans are now my plans. The truth of the matter is, though, that surrendering our plans is one of the biggest sources of overwhelmedness that we face. We don't really recognize how deeply committed we are to these things, <laughs> to our idea of what has to happen and when it has to happen, not to mention how it has to happen. Whether we're single and we're thinking of who we're going to marry, whether we're married and we're thinking of what he's going to do, <laughs> whatever it might be, we have plans that we, that we have a hard time giving up. And that's one of the points when we become so overwhelmed by life because those are being interrupted. We become discontent, frustrated, bitter, worried, because things aren't going the way we thought that they would. I know that it can feel impossible when there's too much to do and there's not enough time to do it. I get that. Or there's too much stuff and there's not enough areas to put it in. That's, that's a big issue that can make you feel like you're drowning in your hoarding. <laughs> I know from experience. And it can feel really impossible when all those things happen to the point where you feel like, I'll, all I can do right now is just shut down. I don't even know where to begin. When I have to clean my house after a, I don't know, two or three week hiatus of doing so, <laughs> when it happens, I look and I say, I literally don't know where to start. And so it's better for me just to get back in bed and just to forget about it. <laughs> when we look at life and all that we have to do, that's when we need to stop and say, you know what, life isn't about me. And it isn't even about what I have to do. It's about what God is going to do and even about what he has done. We look at our to-do list and we think, I've got all this and this and this. And it can become easy to focus on that and remove our eyes from what, what God is doing, what God wants to do in our lives, what God's to-do through you list is. So, yeah, you have a list, but he has a to-do through you list that's much more important than yours. So rather than being surprised, rather than being angry or frustrated that this plan isn't going the way I thought it would, imagine if we just take our eyes off of our plan and say, oh, okay, I see it's going a different direction. What if, what if this direction, surprisingly, is what you wanted in the first place? This is what you had in mind. All of that, I thought I was going to clean that up. I thought I was going to fix that. I'm going to turn away and go the other direction. And I'm not even going to look back there because I don't have to do that. I have to do what God wants me to do. Galatians 3.3 says this, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Now, that, you might not apply that to your plan and, and your overwhelmedness, but just think about that. Everything that's happened in your life spiritually has happened through the Spirit, not through your flesh. You didn't save yourself by your works. And we continue to try and save ourselves by what we're getting done, by our to-do list, by what we have planned, by what we think we're going to even do for God. But again, it's not what we're doing. When we look at this verse in Galatians and we say, it isn't, it isn't something that I want to start taking over now. Why would I take it over now when I've trusted him this far to be, to be the one who's brought me to salvation, to be the one who's saved me? Then we can let go of thinking that we need to be in control because that's really where it all comes down. We don't give credit to God, but to ourselves when we, when we do it ourselves. When you say, look, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, that's giving credit to yourself rather than to God. But we give him credit and glory when we say, I didn't do anything. <laughs> and look what he's done. He put that in front of me. He opened that door and I walked through it. Not, I'm going to get this door open. <laughs> but I saw an open door and so, I, and so I went through it. I only try and walk through doors which are, which are opened. And that brings us to our next point. Uh, belief in the sovereignty, power, and goodness of God gives us an overwhelming sense of his ability to do the impossible. Belief in the sovereignty, 
power and goodness of God gives us an overwhelming sense of his ability to do the impossible. See, Mary was told that the impossible would happen. She would get pregnant out of wedlock. Well, she'd get pregnant without a man. <laughs> that, that she would give birth and that he would be the savior of the world. She didn't look at this prospect as overwhelmingly impossible, but as overwhelmingly incredible. When life gives us situations that seem impossible, we just have to stop and say, why would I ever say no and never to God? Why would I say, nope, that's not what I had planned. Never, that will never happen. In improv, uh, which is kind of the game side of theater, when you're in improv, you're told that you always say yes. So if anybody comes up to you and they start to move your joke down a direction you didn't want to go, you don't say, no, 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 I was talking about being a goat, not being a horse, whatever it might be. You always say yes. Yes, I was going to be a goat. You go, with, you go with the flow. And I think that that can be applied to our relationship with God. Why would we ever say no or never? Rather say, yeah, that's the way we'll go. When we're open to do that, the overwhelmedness can become well, it goes behind us, doesn't it? Because we, we're looking at, at all that we have to do. And then when we turn away, oh yeah, we'll go that way. And we go the other direction and we take our minds off of what is so heavy and so overwhelming. When we don't do that, <laughs> instead when we just keep our minds focused on what we have to do, we end up with uh, worry, doubt, busyness, all those things. I just have to focus on this. And we, and we drill down into that. How many of you struggle with worry or doubt? Yes. Busyness, anybody? Busyness? Yeah, I'm, I'm a worrier by nature. I got it, I guess, from an expert. <laughs> my mom taught me that. My mom taught me how to worry. Uh, I'm pretty much sure that everyone's out to get me and the worst is always going to happen, which I'll get into that later <laughs> uh, because that's been a fun journey uh, through, the, through the mires of worry. I'm also a hurrier. I, if I go somewhere, I'm going to go there fast. If I do it, I'm going to do it fast. In fact, I just think anything you can do, I can do faster. <laughs> I'm not guaranteeing it's going to be good, but it'll be faster because I'm, I'm more like quantity over quality. <laughs> I'm okay as, if it's just done. That's all I care about. As long as I did it and I did it fast, we're good. So why do we worry and stress and freak out? The answer to that question is our next point, which is we worry and we stress because at the heart of the matter, we doubt God's provision and protection. <gasps> Wait a minute. Why am I worried? Because I doubt God's provision and protection. We just doubt that he has it all under control. Which we can see in Matthew 6. You know this famous passage. I'm sure you know. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. It's funny how we can trust people to do what they say they're going to do, but we can't always trust God to do what he says he's going to do. That seems kind of a that seems kind of like a weird choice, but think about the people that you trust. I mean, if you have kids, uh, you trust that the people that are taking care of them are taking care of them. Uh, you trust the, the guy that flies the plane, you trust the guy that drives the train, or even the people that are driving in the cars next to you, uh, the people that cook your food. You're not thinking they're poisoning you, hopefully. Uh, but we can trust people with the things they say they're going to do, and yet God says something, and we're like, yeah, I don't know. I maybe better fix that for him. I'm not sure he's going to do that. That can be, it can be easier for us to try and think about what God promises us from that perspective. Because imagine if you lived in the physical life the way you do in the spiritual life. Oh, are you, are you, sh are you sure you're not going to poison my food? Are you, are you sure you're not going to kill my kids while you have them? Some of us do that. Some of us uh, become shut-ins uh, in, my, in my life. 
uh, before um, I became a believer, I fell prey to a lot of the worry of not trusting people. And I can tell you, it just paralyzes you. So it becomes an eye opener when we look at the dichotomy, the difference between the way we look at humans and their promises and the way we look at God's. Jesus said that if we'll only look to him, then he'll carry our burdens. That's a promise. In Matthew 11, 28 to 30, he says those, those famous words about his yoke being light. Now I have a version of that that I, that I wrote just to go with this overwhelmed kind of idea. So you won't see this in your Bible, but let me read you uh, just kind of a, a paraphrase to bring this idea home. It says this, if you have too much to do and not enough time to do it, come to me. Allow me to do the things on my list through you and learn from me because I'm not in a hurry or competing with the world and you'll find rest for your souls because the things I do are easy and my list is short. <gasps> you guys, isn't that great? I mean, that's great. He, he, he's not in a hurry. He's not like, oh, I got to get this done today. He's <laughs> not in a hurry. If you don't get it done today, that's okay because God's not asking you to hurry up. He's not competing with everybody else to make sure you do it better than someone else. And his list is short. In fact, his to do through you list is just got one thing on it. Is all he wants to need to do is just love. That's it. That's his to do through you list is to love. So if you can't do all this stuff you got to do in love, then maybe it's time to just get off the subject of you and your list and get on to his and say, how can I turn this around so that I'm doing the most important thing that I'm doing his list and not my own. When we do that, we're going to stop being so overwhelmed by life and we'll become more overwhelmed by our God. Amen. That's a good time to pray, isn't it? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much, Lord, that you care about everything, that you are in everything that we do, Lord. And I just thank you. I thank you that we don't have to do it all. Thank you that you have done it already. We forget that. We're sorry. We confess we forget that a lot. And we take over. But Lord, we just thank you that you forgive that and that you keep, you keep right on being the God who has the best plan. So help us today to embrace your plans, your interruptions, your changes to our to-do list, and help us today to love more than anything else in the world, to love. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. When faced with impossible feats, like getting it all done, life can be overwhelming. When you have things to do, people to see, and a schedule to keep, but all that gets edited by life, you just want to throw up your hands and surrender. And amazingly, that's exactly what you need to do. Surrender your plans to the one who knows best. The trouble is that we struggle to trust that God's plans are really better than ours. After all, we see what needs to be done. We know the fixes and the must-haves of life and all that knowledge. It leads to worry, busyness, hurry, and stress. As women faced with impossible tasks, we can learn a lot from our girl Mary, who in the face of one of the most overwhelming encounters imaginable, simply replied, I am the Lord's servant. Let everything you've said happen to me. Rather than looking at our own circumstances as overwhelmingly impossible, like Mary, we can remind ourselves that impossible is just another word for yes, Lord, you are able. You can do it, you know, you can trade your doubt for belief when you remember that our God is sovereign, powerful, and good, and he ain't going nowhere. And all he asks of us is to love, that's it. That's his to-do list for you and for me. <sighs> How simple, that's freedom. Listen, you don't have to do it all. Just whatever you do, do with love. And if you do that, my friend, then you'll have done very well. Whatever you are faced with today, May you find peace in knowing and believing that our awesome, overwhelming God is more than enough and that nothing is impossible for Him. See you next week.